Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? This morning, we're going to be reading out of John 4, 14. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. The whole verse says, But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. Very interesting wording that Jesus used here. It will become a fountain springing up into everlasting life. Growing in grace, growing in truth, growing in sanctification. Hmm. Let's read this in context. Let's see. Let's start here in verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, draw with, and the well is deep. That well is still there, by the way. They are pretty sure they found it. Where then do you get the living? Get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Now, what she's, her frame of mind is still carnal. There's a big difference between carnal and spiritual. She's still carnal in her thinking. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. <coughs> this, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now there's there's more in, the, in these scriptures here, especially verse 18 uh, or 17 and 18. Uh, I won't get into that here, but there, there's there's hidden stuff there. Our father worshipped on this, on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. There's, there's a lot of stuff meaning here. This all goes back in the Old Testament. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Notice what he says here. Worship the Father in spirit and in truth. We worship him in the Holy Spirit, and living in the truth, being having integrity. Being a person of integrity, living in truth. Yeah, that's how you worship God, too. Like I told you. Living for God, living the way he said to live, living according to his word. You worship in that. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. That's interesting that the Samaritans would know this. I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ, who is called the anointed. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you and he. Now you know, she probably already started to suspect something was up. That's because she said, I perceive you're a prophet. And then she said this to see what he would say. And he said, you know how much excitement there had to have been. There had to have been a lot of excitement here. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? He had authority. They didn't question him. The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. 
In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Very powerful chapter, John 4. <clears throat> he who is a believer in Jesus finds enough of his Lord to satisfy him now and to content him forevermore. The believer is not the man who, whose days are weary for want of comfort and whose nights are long from absence of heart-cheering thought. For he finds in religion such a spring of joy, such a fountain of consolation, that he is content and happy. This is the peace that defies all understanding and joy inexpressible. Put him in a dungeon, he will find good company. Place him in a barren wilderness, he will eat the bread of heaven. Drive him away from friendship, he will meet the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Blast all his gourds, and he will find shadow beneath the rock of ages. Sap the foundation of his earthly hopes, but his heart will still be fixed, trusting in the Lord. I can relate to that one. I can relate to that one. Big time. Trust in the Lord. Uh oh. <laughs> Dogs heard something outside. The heart is as insatiable as the grave till Jesus enters it, and then it is a cup full to overflowing. There is such a fullness in Christ that he alone is the believer's all. The true saint is so completely satisfied with the all sufficiency of Jesus that he thirsts no more except it be for deeper draughts of the living fountain. real quiet all of a sudden. Okay. In that sweet manner, believer, shalt thou thirst? It shall not be a thirst of pain, but of loving desire. Thou wilt find it a sweet thing to be panting after a fuller enjoyment of Jesus' love. One in days of yore said, I have been sinking my bucket down into the well full often, but now my thirst after Jesus has become so insatiable that I long to put the well itself to my lips. To drink right on. Is this the feeling of thine heart now, believer? Dost thou feel that all thy desires are satisfied in Jesus, and that thou hast no want now, but to know more of him, and to have closer fellowship with him? I think all of us here are in that boat. Some of you, some of you watch and don't comment, and yet I know that this is where you stand. We all stand in this place. We just want to know more about our Lord. And when we find something in the scripture or we see him working in, in the people around us or in the, the things around us, it just, it's all the more exciting. Then come continually to the fountain and take of the water of life freely. Jesus will never think you take too much but will ever welcome you, saying, Drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. We have full access to this water of life. What is that? The spirit of salvation. This word. Technically, the word is the bread of heaven. The water of life is the spirit. The Holy Spirit. We can drink of as much as we want. We can eat of this word as much as we want. This is why the Lord has driven me back to the Word. This is why I try to spread that message, get back into the Word, stay in the Bible, keep reading it, keep studying, find a version you understand, read it and read it and read it. Look deeper into it. Look into the original language. You're going to discover all kinds of incredible things. You're going to realize so much of what we're being told from other people today isn't actually accurate because the Bible says something different. There's a bunch of people. Jen Markell had a video today, and she had another guy on from Colorado. Great people, but he he believes, like Andy Woods does, that the literal city of Babylon is going to be rebuilt. Okay, well, that's fine, but you have to keep in mind, in order for that to be Mystery Babylon, it has to be the center of the world trade. There is no way you're going to do that in, in another couple, in one or two years. The, it takes for there's nothing there. It takes forever to get an infrastructure established. You, you're not going to throw it up in a day. You're not going to throw it up in a year. You're not going to throw it up in five years. <clears throat> and then you've got to get people to live there. 
then you've got to get trade going. You got to get businesses going. You know, you could be looking at a hundred years. Just not going to happen. We have to take into account also that Jeremiah, God said, when it's destroyed, I'm going to utterly destroy it and it will be uninhabited forevermore. He did that. And it hasn't been inhabited since to this very day. It's a, the, the actual core of the, where the city sat. Nobody lives there. It's a World Heritage Site. It's a museum. Nobody lives there. And because God said nobody would live there and nobody lives there. So that doesn't make any sense. Well, let's go into the scriptures and look at what the scriptures say. Boom, Jeremiah obliterates all their theories. There cannot be another uh, revamped or rebuilt city of Babylon. And, and besides, when it says that they, they sit afar off in the oceans looking, watching her smoke of her burning, the mystery of Babylon. The city of Babylon, I've been there. The city of Babylon is over 350 miles from the nearest ocean. And that's the bay the, that, down in Kuwait. Doesn't fit. None of the criteria fits. I did a huge video on this. I have a playlist with a bunch of videos I did on this. In one of them, we covered nearly 600 scriptures, several hours long, looking deeper into this to figure out what what's what does the Bible really say? See, the entity of Babylon they're looking for is the daughter of Babylon, the product of Babylon. And only one nation fits that. See, when we read the Bible, we learn what it really means what he's really saying, what we really should be doing. We learn what actual the actual baptism is referencing and what it's for. We learn what real belief is. We learn what really walking in the spirit is. We learn what really walking in truth is. We learn how we live for God and glorify God by walking in integrity because the Bible tells us to do those things. We learn what he really meant because we're taking the time to sit down and look at the words and read them because in doing so not listening to it in your car on a tape not listening to it you know somebody's talk about you reading it you are in direct fellowship with the lord by doing so this word is him in writing john makes it clear in john 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and then the word became flesh and dwelt among men that's Jesus Christ. This word is Jesus Christ. This whole Bible is Jesus Christ. You can't take one or two pieces out of it and say, well, those don't count. God inspired men to put this Bible together this way. These books, and these books mathematically connect to each other. These books reference each other. These books in every way possible cannot be separated. God did that. So this word is the written representation of Jesus Christ. Jesus made it clear in the volume of the book, it's written of me. In the whole of the book, it's written of me. What book? You can't say the Torah and the Tanakh because he read from Isaiah. He quoted from at least six other books that aren't in that. Jesus said, you want to know the truth? You have Moses and the prophets. Believe them. Well, that makes it a whole lot more than five books. That's the whole Old Testament. That's the entire Old Testament because that's all it is, is Moses and the prophets. When we read the Bible ourselves, we learn about the Lord. The Holy Spirit teaches us so we're in the Bible, we're getting the bread, the meat of the word. When the Holy Spirit is teaching us, we're getting the water of life. You cannot believe how incredible it is to have this singular connection like this, to go into this book, take the time and read it for yourself. Don't believe what others say, read it for yourself. Take what they say and go test it. Lord, is this what they're saying? And prove it. And what you'll start to find is you'll start to find there's a whole lot of people out there that are missing a lot of key details. And so we believe what the word says. Now, here's the thing. Does it really matter who Mystery Babylon is? For us, no, technically it doesn't. However, if you have a pretty 
close indicator of who it is. You know who not to have dealings with. You know who not to get involved in. You, you know who not to follow. And see, because of who I think Mystery Babylon is there, I see a great many people following after an entity that is evil, an entity that is of the synagogue of Satan, an entity that is going after the wrong thing, and they're leading people that way. So by knowing these things in the book of Revelation, you know what to watch for and what to avoid. I saw one of the guys from Prophecy Watchers was talking about um, how he went into an uh, Amazon store and he had to use his phone with the QR code to even get access into the store. Other people were coming through and using their hand, just waving it over. Why would he do that? As a Christian, why would he do that? Now, it's not the mark of the beast, but it's conditioning. All this we have now is conditioning for the mark of the beast because you had to take your phone with your right hand and hold it over that scanner because it's on the right hand side to get in. They use biometrics, shows on your face, forehead. We got Christians out there using AI. Why are they doing that? They know this is all part of the system. See, it's conditioning. They're conditioning people to be okay with these things. And the very next thing is you step right into the realm of the beast. This analogy works perfectly for this. Put a frog in a pot of boiling water. He jumps out immediately. Put a frog in cold water and very gradually bring the water up to boiling. And he'll never know he's about to die until he does. And he will boil to death and never once leave because his body gets used to the temperature. If we're being conditioned for these things that this is, oh, this isn't harmless. Oh, this is harmless. Well, this is the mark of the beast. Yeah, we can play with it. No, at some point you've got to stop and say, I'm not going any further. In a lot of cases, we can't help it. There's certain things that have changed and we can't help that they've changed because all the big powers have been, but at some point we've got to stop and say, okay, this is too far. I can't go any further. We learn these things by reading the scriptures, by fellowship with God through his word, through the Holy Spirit. We learn about these things. And those are just examples. There's so much more. This is why we must be engaging in concourse through the word. We must be feasting on this bread of life, drinking of this water of life. Because it is the Holy Spirit who will teach us when we sit down and read this word. And this has been the message the whole time. I talk about people repeating themselves. I've been repeating myself about this for almost five years now. Creeping up on five years. It'll be five years, uh, January of next year. Read, read, read the Bible. Because that's the message I was given. Tell them to read, read, read the Bible. Because all of a sudden you'll realize, whoa. Oh, I got to quit going to that church. They're not teaching biblical doctrine. They're teaching heresy. And the Bible gives us clear instructions on what to do and when to avoid those things and who to avoid. Because if we get ourselves caught up in that stuff, if we get ourselves involved in that, if we're touching the unclean thing, that is going to come in between us and him. And that's not what we want. We don't want to be distracted by that. We don't want to be drawn away by that. We don't want to get involved in that. We want to stay focused on him. If we thirst for the Lord, if we hunger for the Lord and more of him, we need to be in this book, plain and simple. But, you know, for a lot of people, that's a really hard thing to do. Attention spans today are very short. That's why a lot of people will skip through this and go right to the prayer. Because they don't want to hear any of this. They just want to hear the prayer. And if they don't like that, they'll skip to the end and then they'll go on. It happens. I know it happens because the uh, demographic page shows us as a YouTuber. But it's okay. Because the message is still there regardless. And people are hearing it. People are growing because of this. People are taking these things that I'm sharing and they're going and applying them and realizing I should have done this years ago. If you want more of the Lord, this is how you do it. You start with prayer, then you get into the Bible and start reading the Bible and let the Holy Spirit teach you these things. And you will be amazed at the difference it will make in your walk with the Lord and in your life in this world.
because it is such a blessing and a privilege for us to have this written word, this royal word of the Lord in the palm of our hands. The very technology Satan is trying to use to destroy mankind is the same technology the Lord is using to save them. Amazing. Satan meant it for evil. God means it for good. Because my personal opinion is, even though there's good that can come out of a cell phone and computers and all this connection we have, there's a great deal of evil that comes out of it too. But the Lord isn't going to let him have his way. The Lord isn't going to uh, let him win the day. Jesus has already won the day. Jesus has already won the victory. We're just finishing out the final battles. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. To lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word and thank you for this devotion. Lord, I thank you that you have given us your son. Jesus, I thank you that you have given us yourself in written form that we may have fellowship with you right here in this book. This word of truth that so many deny. Some take Paul out. Some take the Old Testament out. Some take um, Mark out, but read Matthew, Luke, and John. Some take Luke out and read the other three. Some take out uh, some of the some of the stuff Paul said, but leave the other stuff that Paul said in there. People are very nitpicky about your word. You gave us this whole council on purpose. We did not go become more powerful than you to the point that we could change your word against your will. You are an omnipotent God. You are omniscient. We can't do that. We don't have that ability. We don't have that kind of power. Your word will stand. And in every case, we can prove 100% that this word has stood. That it has not been corrupted. It has not been changed. Because we can go all the way back to before when it was first being written and see and prove that it has not been changed. And yet there are still people out there speaking when they should be silent, teaching when they should be learning, condemning when they should be leading people to salvation and taking themselves there at the same time. Lord, you provide us with this water of life through the Holy Spirit, this wonderful, pure water that brings life forever. We thirst no more because we have full access to it. We hunger no more because we have full access to your word. The problem is you give us this banquet and set it, the table before us, and so many turn and go. So many turn and go to McDonald's or Burger King or some fast food restaurant, when you have laid a banquet of food that will sustain us forever, they go and get the, they go get the junk food. A lot of these churches, that's, that's how I see them. That's, that's a McDonald's. That's a Burger King. It's all junk food. It's KFC. It's all junk food. There's a Pizza Hut. They're just giving you stuff that you're just going to, you're going to be hungry again. Why don't we go to you to get the bread of life? Let's go eat at God's table. We should be eating at your table, Lord, where the bread of life is, where the water of life is. And yet we don't. <clears throat> and yet we don't. What a terrible, terrible state we are in today as a church. That not only do we avoid reading your word and learning from it and applying it, but we go find people who are purposefully avoiding certain things in your word. There are people out there that have been doing stuff longer than me that there are certain chapters in the Bible they haven't even begun to cover. Certain books that they avoid at all costs because it will prove them wrong. And their violent response to somebody telling them about that is proof. Well, Father, it's all going to come to a screeching halt at some point. Judging by the signs that we've been given in the Bible and looking at the signs we have today, that time is now. Well, you have not left us without a focal point. You have not left us without an anchor point. You have not left us without the rock of ages, without the, the cornerstone of the foundation. 
You have not left us without building materials with, with which we can build on that foundation. You have not left us without anything that we need. We have it all right here in your word and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. So I thank you, Father, for this holy word again. I thank you for the Holy Spirit you have given us to lead us in truth, to show us what we should avoid, what we must avoid, and what we might need to avoid, to show us what to watch out for, to show us who to fellowship with and who not to, and to show us how rich the fellowship between brothers and sisters who are in the same mind, who are in the same spirit can be, and how rich beyond comparison the fellowship with you is when we read your word and drink of the water of life. Father, make us to understand this. Make us to seek out and hunger for this bread of the life, this word of life, and to seek out and thirst for the water of life, the spirit of life, that we may live. And give us the ability to share it with others, that they may live too. We thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. We thank you for your great love, your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for morning devotion. It is amazing that sometimes the simplest things are the hardest things for people. That guy that I was talking to a couple days ago, Show me one verse. Show me one verse. I showed him over 70 verses. Nothing. There are people out there, great majority of them out there, who aren't interested in the truth. They're just interested in telling people what they think. They're just interested in making the Bible work out to match what they believe <clears throat> instead of them changing what they believe to equal or match the Bible. Well, God's word stands firm and stands true and only has one meaning to it, not multiple. We're not going to sit here and have multiple meanings to the same scripture. It doesn't work that way. It does for us because that's how we like to do things. We like to give multiple definitions to something when it, in reality it only has one. Well, God's word only has one meaning. And it is irresponsible of any of us to try to add or take away from that word because God said in the book of Revelation, and a lot of people love to say, oh, well, that's just the book of Revelation. No, it's the whole book because this whole book is a book of prophecy. Anyone caught adding to or taking away from this word? I will add the plagues of this book to him, which means he'll put you in the tribulation or I will take his name from the book of life. That's scary. That terrifies me. A lot of people try to explain that away. Well, can he really do that? Well, he's God, first of all. Yes, he can. Will he? I don't know. That's his call, not mine. But that is a terrifying warning. You take away from this book, I will take away your name from the book of life. What a terrible thing. I will take your part away from your inheritance away. What a terrible thing. So I'm going to take that warning for its full, full force uh, meaning, face value. And not add to this book, not take away from this book, but read it for what it says. Fellowship with the Lord, with him teaching me, not me trying to teach him. Eat this bread of life and enjoy it and drink of the water of life. And be saved. Just believe and ye shall have eternal life. It's so simple. But people today seem to go out of their way to make things complicated. I don't know why. I don't know why. I have it happening in my own household. I don't understand it. Why would you complicate something that's simple? Leave it alone. But they do it anyway. I don't know. The Lord will deal with it all. The Lord will fix it all. The Lord is coming to take care of all of this. All we have to do is hold strong in what we know is true. And that's contained right here in, these, in this book. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I'll see you in the next video.